If you're a regular here on my channel, you know I love to talk about mass extinctions. But one thing I haven't talked much about is how life recovers after these huge mass extinction events. I mean, some of these events took out over 90% of species on Earth. So what exactly happens after an event like that? How does life find its footing again? And how long does it take? Well, there was recently a new paper published in GSA's journal Geology about how life recovered after the Ordovician mass extinction event, the first of the big five mass extinctions in the Phanerozoic Eon, which I've talked a ton about on my channel. And I'll link a bunch of videos down in the description box below if you want to hear more about those specific events. I'll get more into the details of the new findings this paper presented in a second, but first I want to provide a little bit of overview, some context regarding mass extinctions and when this event occurred, what Earth was like at the time, what life was like at the time, just so we're all on the same page with understanding when and where we are in Earth history. So the big five mass extinctions, if you haven't seen my past videos, are the five largest mass extinctions that have occurred in the last 540 million years, or what we call the Phanerozoic Eon. While these aren't the only mass extinctions to have occurred throughout Earth's history, our evidence for mass extinctions before around 540 million years ago is lacking because there's a lack of fossil record. This was really before life had hard parts, so things like skeletons and shells that became more easily preserved in rocks. And so really the only things around were squishy microbes that didn't get preserved as easily in the rocks. So yes, we have geochemical evidence that suggests that there were likely major climate events and changes throughout the Archean and Proterozoic that probably caused major mass extinctions. And we can estimate how many species might have gone extinct based on how drastic the climate change might have been and how rapid it might have been, but we can't quantify anything based on a fossil record because we don't have a complete fossil record. We never have a complete fossil record, but we have a lot more fossils for the Phanerozoic, which is why the big five mass extinctions are defined in the Phanerozoic. We can find them. The late Ordovician mass extinction is the first of the big five mass extinctions, and it occurred around 445 million years ago. So a lot of people think of this as the first mass extinction. That said, another caveat to this is that these five mass extinctions, the Phanerozoic, are not the only mass extinctions that occurred in the Phanerozoic. There are thought to have been mass extinctions during the Cambrian before the Ordovician. There are thought to have been other mass extinctions between these big five mass extinctions throughout the Phanerozoic Eon. It's just that these are the five largest ones. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when we call this Ordovician event the first mass extinction. With that out of the way, I do have a video which I'll link below and to the top right here if you're interested, that's all about this Ordovician mass extinction event, which actually funnily enough has to do with moss. So I often nickname it the moss extinction. I didn't come up with that, one of my commenters did. So shout out to Ted and whoever else commented that in my Ordovician video. But this moss extinction and how it involved moss and how it played out and, and what were the causes and effects of this extinction are all things that I cover in that video. So if you wanna check that out, it's linked below. But today we'll be talking about the new discoveries from this new 2025 paper in geology and what these discoveries tell us about how life recovered after this first mass extinction. But before we jump right into all the details, you might be wondering, why do we care? Why do we care about reconstructing past mass extinction events and how life recovered after those events in the first place. Well, understanding how life has recovered after past mass extinction events helps us better understand resilience in modern ecosystems, as well as predict which types of ecosystems and species will have high or low resiliency when it comes to modern environmental changes. So first, just for context about the Ordovician period and life at this time, complex animal ecosystems had only appeared by around 540 million years ago during the Cambrian explosion. Some slightly simpler, slightly softer bodied complex animal ecosystems did evolve earlier and underwent major diversification during the Ediacaran period around 570 million years ago. But across the entire geologic timescale, animal ecosystems by the Ordovician mass extinction, which was again around 440 million years ago, 
were relatively new. And keep in mind, they were also still just marine. This was before any land animals or plants had evolved. Like I mentioned on the previous slide, mosses and, and non-vascular plants had just begun to spread on land right before the Andor Division event. And early in the Silurian, there were potentially some early insects on land, but overall, Earth looked very different than it does today. But the Ordovician is known for much more than an extinction event. Actually, there was a major increase in biodiversity during the Ordovician period, about 40 million years after the Cambrian explosion. So it began around 500 million years ago and went almost till the end Ordovician mass extinction. And this event is called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. I actually have a whole video about that as well, so I'll link it at the top, right? But essentially this event where biodiversity was just increasing like crazy for kind of the first time on Earth when, within animal ecosystems, this event was stopped by the late Ordovician mass extinction. The Ordovician mass extinction hit in two pulses. The first pulse was marked by rapid cooling and glaciation, so ice spread, which caused regression or sea level fall because as more ice forms from seawater, that traps a bunch of water into the ice and causes the rest of the liquid water on Earth, the oceans, to fall in sea level. And this sea level fall is really important with regards to contributing to the mass extinctions at the time because it eliminated shallow marine ecosystems as sea level fell really rapidly, causing a lot of those shallow seas that had transgressed onto continents to essentially disappear that caused the ecosystems that inhabited those shallow seas to disappear as well. Pulse two of this mass extinction event or kind of the climate changes and environmental changes that caused the mass extinctions was marked by rapid warming, kind of a bounce back after the rapid cooling event and associated with this warming was rapid ocean anoxia or decrease in ocean oxygen concentrations. Remember, just like us here on land and in the atmosphere, we breathe in oxygen, so do marine animals. Marine animals need dissolved oxygen to be present in the water to live. And when these oxygen concentrations decrease really rapidly during rapid global warming events, this is one of the major drivers of mass extinctions, including the late Ordovician mass extinction. So this combination of intense temperature swings, sea level fall, and ocean anoxia wiped out around 85% of marine species during the late Ordovician. And remember, these were the only species at the time were marine. So this is of all species on Earth at the time. And now finally getting into the new discoveries of this 2025 paper that give us an idea of maybe how life recovered and how long it took life to recover after this mass extinction event that took out 85% of all species. So these researchers that published this paper discovered a new, a full new assemblage of fossils from the early Silurian, so the period right after, the, the beginning of the period right after this event. So just a few million years after this event occurred. And this assemblage is located in South China and this is where it would have been around the time of deposition on this map here, which is a figure from this paper. And they're calling this fossil assemblage, this group of animals preserved in these rocks, the Hengxi fauna. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, it is just a paper. It is not an audio file. <laughs> but these fossils represent recovering ecosystems right after the first of the big five mass extinctions. And they include sponges, cephalopods like nautiloids and arthropods. Pods. But what's so special about these particular fossils? Well, this assemblage is dominated by hexactinilid sponges, which are also called glass sponges because they are known for their glass or silica spicules. Their spicules are made of silica, SiO2, which is the same thing that we make glass from. And the other thing that glass sponges are known for is living in the deep sea. And then these fossils are also preserved in a rock called black shale, which black shales are these muddy, very organic matter rich rocks. That's why they're, they're black because the organic matter is, makes the color darker, but these muddy organic matter rich rocks that are deposited in deep 
calm waters. So this all points to the fact that this assemblage of fossils represents a deep water ecosystem. And this is important because the finding of this kind of ecosystem right after this event in black shales, no less, which often represent anoxia, ocean anoxia, the lack of oxygen, this finding of these fossils there challenges the assumption that post-extinction black shales were entirely lifeless, at least with regards to animal life, things that need oxygen to live, because of anoxia, the lack of oxygen. So what exactly does this mean? Well, it suggests that there was intermittent oxygenation of the deep sea following the Ordovician mass extinction event, meaning that maybe the deep sea wasn't as anoxic as we thought it was for as prolonged a period of time after that event. This means that the ocean anoxia that contributed so heavily to the extinctions during that event ended relatively quickly after the event, even in some parts of the deep sea, not just in shallow marine environments, which likely greatly helped marine ecosystems recover. But how does all of this recovery of life right after the Ordovician extinction event compare to the recovery of life after other extinction events? And what implications might this hold for our understanding of how life might respond on modern Earth to modern and future environmental changes? Well, there's one major similarity across all mass extinction events when it comes to the recovery of life after these events, and that is that the recovery tends to start with opportunistic or simple and or simple organisms like microbes, microbial mats, and sponges. Sponges are very primitive, very simple organisms. They were potentially the very first multicellular animals on Earth. And that one of the reasons that we think that is because they're so simple. They're hardly even multicellular. They're kind of just an amalgamation of single cells, which is super cool. But these very, very simple and opportunistic organisms are the ones that tend to start life's recovery after the event. A couple things here I also want to note. Sponges in particular are really good at living in very low oxygen conditions. There are sponges that are even known to be able to handle anoxic conditions, conditions without oxygen for certain periods of time. This is another reason that sponges are a bit more resilient and, and might recover more quickly after mass extinction events throughout all of the Phanerozoic extinction events, not just the Ordovician one. And then another note on things like algae and bacterial mats and whatnot, these guys don't have so much a problem with the lack of oxygen because they make it. <laughs> so that's one reason that we often see you know, cyanobacteria or other bacteria and algae recovering quite quickly after these major events because they are the primary producers. They are the ones that can autotrophically or, or on their own produce their own food by, you know, using sunlight energy to photosynthesize. That said, there are one-off events and weird mass extinctions that involve things like dust and ash thrown up into the atmosphere after asteroid impacts like the KPG boundary that blocked sunlight. So that would have really hindered photosynthesizers, which are typically more resilient. So it depends on the mass extinction, but for the case of the Ordovician and most mass extinctions throughout the Phanerozoic, bacteria and algae, as well as sponges, are typically very early to recover. But there are differences in how life recovers after mass extinction events across the different big five mass extinctions of the Phanerozoic. The one major difference being duration of recovery. We can see in this diversity chart over here, the big dips and diversity are the big five mass extinctions. And you can see that after each one, life recovers in this big upswing in diversity after each event. But sometimes that's a little slower than others. So the magnitude and duration of the extinction event itself, as well as the environmental conditions, things like oxygen availability and climate stability, play the big roles when it comes to controlling recovery duration. For example, the late Devonian extinction was a little bit more staggered and, and protracted in terms of how the event, the initial extinction event occurred. So the recovery was a little bit more staggered and protracted in time and, and drawn out on geologic timescale compared to the Ordovician, which was a very quick extinction event and a much faster recovery. 
And finally, this kind of brings us back to another why point. Why do we care? Why do we care about the similarities and differences between recovery of life after these different extinction events? Well, this research really emphasizes the importance of foundational organisms like sponges and corals and other organisms that build reefs for helping other life recover and or thrive uh, in general and, and become more resilient against environmental change. So this is really important because, you know, as our oceans become more anoxic and acidic due to current global warming, we will need to understand which organisms within ecosystems are the ones that are more resilient versus those that maybe are more threatened to these types of changes to better understand where we need to focus our conservation efforts and our efforts to, to strengthen these ecosystems as environmental changes occur. So I hope you enjoyed learning about this new paper and our new understanding of how life recovered after the Ordovician mass extinction event. And if you want to hear more about that event specifically, I'll link my old video that I have about that event specifically up on the screen for you. And with that, guys, references are linked down below as always, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.